All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our final screencast for Chapter 2. And so what we're going to do today is we are going to focus on Section 2.4. Now, if you recall, we just finished up 2.3 with dealt with the macromolecules. And so if you think about the macromolecules, we had talked about carbohydrates, we talked about lipids, we talked about nucleic acids, and then we also talked about proteins. And if you recall, proteins had lots of different types of jobs when it comes down to what they can do for our body. Now, there's a specific type of protein called enzymes, which are really important because what they do is they actually help to control chemical reactions that take place within our body. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to look at what is a chemical reaction. Now, I'm guessing that most of you have probably taken physical science in middle school, and my guess is they did discuss chemical reactions in regards to chemistry. Now, most of the time when you talk about chemistry, you're talking about chemical reactions that occur with inorganic substances, and so in other words, things that are not considered alive. But in our case, we're looking at chemical reactions that actually occur inside of living things. Now, that doesn't mean there's a difference in terms of the definition, because if you look here, a chemical reaction is simply a change or a transformation of one set of chemicals into another by the breaking of chemical bonds. And an important piece of this slide is right here, chemical bonds. And what we're looking at is we're looking at actually two sides to that chemical reaction. We're looking at the reactants, which are the parts that you're going to bring together. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, for this chemical reaction, this is hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and this is going to be the reactants for this reaction. And we're going to take these parts and rearrange them and reform them to create brand new products. And so the products are always going to be on the right-hand side. So when this reaction proceeds from the left to the right, and this reaction is going to actually be encouraged by the um, enzyme catalase, what we end up getting is a rearrangement which produces two molecules of H2O, which is just water, and then one molecule of O2, which is simply oxygen. And so this would be a good example of a chemical reaction. Now that you have the basic idea of what a chemical reaction is, we also need to understand that there is going to be a certain amount of energy that's going to be necessary to make sure that reaction gets started. And what we do is we call that energy activation energy. And it's kind of easy to know what this um, energy is used for because it's used to activate something. So in this case, it's used to activate the reaction. Now down here towards the bottom, what we're looking at is we're looking at actually two different types of reactions. One is called an energy absorbing reaction and one is called an energy releasing reaction. Now there's one of these that actually takes a lot of energy to make sure it goes from the left to the right. In other words, taking those reactants and reform them into the products. And that's going to be our energy absorbing reaction. And we know it takes a lot of activation energy because if you look here, the amount that you see from this point to this point is quite substantial. In other words, the hilt that these reactants have to go over, in other words, the amount of energy that needs to be put into the system to actually create those products is pretty large. Now, for those um, reactions that are considered energy-releasing reactions, for example, those reactions that might cause a very large explosion, there's not quite as much energy necessary. And if you notice, they actually start off with a little bit more energy than you would see over here on the left-hand side. On the left, these started out with very little amount of energy, so a lot of energy had to be put into it, but the ones on the right already had a bit of energy stored in the chemical bonds of those reactants. So there really wasn't a, as much energy necessary to get it to go over the hill. So again, you need to make sure you compare the amounts of activation energy in both. This one takes a lot, this one not so much. Now, the main focus of this particular screencast is making sure you have a good understanding of enzymes. But like we had said, you need to understand that there's tons and tons of chemical reactions that are occurring inside of your body, and a lot of those chemical reactions actually could not proceed or could not proceed fast enough if it wasn't for enzymes. The main focus, the main purpose of an enzyme is to speed up all of those chemical reactions that are occurring inside of our cells. And what they do is they do that by lowering the activation energy. So remember, the activation energy was simply that energy necessary to get that reaction to proceed. Now, enzymes are considered biological catalysts. And so I put this in here because there are things that are considered inorganic catalysts. In other words, you find these types of um, molecules that speed up reactions in non-living things as well. And if it's in a non-living thing, we call it a catalyst. But if it's in a living thing, it's called an enzyme. So basically, you need to think about it this way. 
all enzymes are considered catalysts, but not all catalysts are considered enzymes. And the main reason for that is because there are catalysts that you will find inside of non-living things. Now, the one thing also to understand is you will never, ever have any type of enzyme or catalyst that will be used up or changed during the chemical reaction. They simply are there to help to speed it up. So there's no rearrangement of those molecules, and they can be used over and over again. Now, they are very specific to a chemical reaction. So there are some enzymes that work for some reactions, but they won't work for others. And an easy way to recognize whether or not a molecule is considered an enzyme is always look at the end of the name of the enzyme. Most cases, you're going to notice that it ends in ASC. So that's the identifier that that particular molecule is considered an enzyme. Now, down here towards the bottom, this is basically illustrating the effects of enzymes. And like I said, the main focus is to make sure these enzymes can lower this activation energy. So if you notice, we have this blue line right through here. We have the same reaction, but one is using an enzyme and one is not. So with the blue line, you notice we have a huge hill that we have to go over in order for that um, set of reactants to be transformed into those products. But if we add an enzyme to the system, you're going to notice that the activation energy actually is less. In other words, it doesn't take quite as much energy to make our way over the hill. So the pink line that you see right here is going to be the reaction with an enzyme, so it helps to lower that activation energy, while the one that is blue does not have the enzyme, so it's going to take a lot more energy, a lot more effort to actually take those reactants and reform them into the products. So when you think about an enzyme, oftentimes it's really easy to understand how they work if you sort of relate it to a lock and key type of model. Enzymes are basically there to provide a site or a place where those reactants can be brought together, rearranged, and actually produce the products. And as we had said, the enzymes work to reduce the amount of activation energy. So here it says such a site is going to reduce the energy necessary for the reaction to occur. So you're going to see sort of that lock and key type model over here on the right hand side. Now there are four main parts when you talk about enzymes. You have a substrate, you have an active site, you have something called the enzyme substrate complex, and then of course you have the products that you're going to form at the very end. So keep in mind, enzymes are there to help speed up a reaction. So if you look over here, we have the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, and we know it's an enzyme because we look at that ASC at the end. So this green blob that you see right here is our enzyme. So its main job is to help to speed up the reaction. In other words, we have water, we have carbon dioxide. So we're trying our best to make sure that those come together really quickly. And so there's a special site called the active site, which you see right here, that is going to act to bring those two items together. And you can see that represented right here. This whole thing, once you have the reactants in the enzyme, once those reactants are in that active site, then we call it the enzyme substrate complex. And if you notice, the substrates are going to be converted into products. And so basically, whatever those reactants were, which they were water and carbon dioxide up here, are going to be rearranged. And once they're rearranged, it's going to be released. And when they're released, it's going to produce those products that we were looking for. And in this case, the products are carbonic acid. Now, one thing real quick. Oftentimes, people will get confused. What is a substrate? The substrate is simply the same thing as the reactants. And so reactants equals the substrate. So please don't get confused by that. So again, the substrates are going to be the reactants of the chemical reaction. So those things on the left-hand side. Active side is where they're going to be brought together. Enzyme substrate complex is when you actually have both of them together as one. And the products, of course, are whatever is going to be produced by that reaction. Now we call it the lock and key because, as we said before, basically enzymes are very specific to the type of reactions they're going to um, um, basically encourage to proceed. And so basically these reactants that you see right here are the only reactants that can fit in that active site. Nothing else can get in there. Now there's lots of different ways that enzymes can actually be controlled. There are times when enzymes can be affected by temperature, times they can be affected by pH, then there's times they can actually be affected by things called chemical regulators. Now when you think about temperature, believe it or not, enzymes have a very specific temperature where they work best. And oftentimes that optimum temperature, at least for us, 
is going to be around 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. Now that's important because 38 to 40 degrees Celsius is body temperature and so that's where our enzymes do the best work. Now if you deviate from that temperature, if you go too high or you go too low, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a decrease in enzyme activity. Basically you're going to denature the enzyme and what that means is you're going to change the shape of the enzyme. So as we had said before, when you think about the enzyme itself and you think about that active site that's inside that only accepts certain types of substrates or reactants, if you change this shape whatsoever, those substrates or reactants can no longer fit, so the enzyme can no longer work. That's considered denatured. Now pH, again, how acid or basic the environment is, will also act to denature or change the shape of that enzyme. And there's also some chemical regulators out there that will either block the active site, in other words, not allow those substrates to get in, or they're going to change the shape of the enzyme as well. So there are various things out in our environment that can actually be used to sort of alter or affect how those enzymes function. All right, so that's going to finish up our screencast over section 2.4, and in fact, it's going to be our very last screencast for chapter 2. Now, as always, it's really important that you make sure to get these screencast notes completed before you come to class.